The grain markets were mixed, with the soy complex mostly lower, wheat higher, and corn supported by a round of export demand. Livestock futures were also mixed, with the cattle complex mostly lower and lean hog sharply higher. And cotton futures bounced off support to end with a solid gain. Live from the lookout high atop hump day via Farm Journal broadcast, this is Agritalk. This afternoon, we begin with a conversation with Darren Hudson from the International Center of Agricultural Competitiveness at Texas Tech. Directly following the news, Todd Bubba Horowitz, I'm handsome newsman Davis Michelson. Now, say hello to the host of Agritalk, Chip Flory. All right, Davis. Hey, thank you so much. And welcome to Agritalk, the PM version of Agritalk, mm-hmm. where we talk markets. Mm-hmm. And today... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're going to be talking cotton market, okay? International but, Center of Agricultural Competitiveness at Texas yeah. Technical University. Darren yeah, Hudson. Darren's Darren's Twitter handle Ooh. is competitive <laughs> yeah. ag. That's easier to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I I will admit, many many years ago already, uh-huh. when I uh, was was looking for someone to talk about cotton and what's what's going on in the cotton market, and I saw that Twitter handle at Competitive Ag. I'm like, <laughs> I got to get this guy on. This will well, sure. be great. So yeah, yeah so yeah. we've had Darren on the show basically since the beginning of mm-hmm. Market Rally, and here we are. Uh, well, it's a good thing too because no one knows where he came from or where he went. No one's seen Cotton Eye Joe. You can't count on that guy. You got to get no. somebody else, and here we are. No. That's right. That's right. The thing about the conversation with Darren is, yeah, we're going to use the supply and demand balance sheet for cotton. As kind of a guide, okay. but it's going to get us into talking about uh, economic conditions here in the U.S. It'll Ooh. get us talking about economic conditions in China. Uh-huh. It, it it it's the gateway to a lot of conversations that hmm. uh, that that matter and matter big time to the ag commodities. So, looking forward to the conversation with Darren. All right, All right. how you doing? Everything good? I think. I think everything's really, really good. Yeah. Wow. We're like mid seventies, lovely sunshine outside. Um, That's yeah, awesome. things are things are good. How about you? That's awesome. Yeah. I had to open up the door. We're only sixty degrees here outside the bunker, but yeah. Yeah. But that's warm enough to open up the door for me. All that's right, man. Let's get to the news. What do you got? Yes, sir. Wheat futures worked with corn to trade higher for much of the session. Price gains were limited by the weather forecast for Russia's winter wheat areas where beneficial rains are expected in the next 10 days to encourage late year seedings. Price support came from a slightly lower than average seedings pace for the U.S. winter wheat crop and from word that French wheat supplies outside of the European Union will be off by about 60-60% from a year ago. Yeah. December soft red winter wheat futures opened higher, dropped through support at 580 and at yesterday's low, and then prices recovered to close near session highs. December HRW wheat futures five and three quarters higher at 588 and three quarters. December SRW wheat up five and a half cents to 585. Uh, not quite settled yet on my screen here. December spring wheat 620 and one half. Uh, last report, that's up four and a quarter on the day. Right, right. These SRW wheat. Trading around that 580 level again, it, it, to me, it's very important. Uh, we need to stay above that 580 level um, if we're going to have any hopes of working this market higher. If we close below 580 uh, even once this week, uh, I'm, it's going to concern me uh, just what the downside risk might be. Well, Chip, corn prices were boosted by a dose of export news. USDA this morning reported the sale of 1.6 million metric tons of U.S. corn to Mexico. Of that tally, 1.04 is for delivery in the current marketing year and nearly 580,000 tons for delivery in the 25-26 marketing year. USDA also reported the sale of 332,000 metric tons of U.S. corn for delivery to unknown destinations in the current marketing year. Despite that demand, news December corn futures posted an inside trading day with a session low open and a high range close. December corn futures three and a half cents higher at 404 and three quarters. March corn up three cents, 420 and one half. 
July corn futures closed at 434, up two and a half cents. Some excellent demand news there, Chip. Yeah, almost two million tons of corn demand in there, and all we could get out of it was the three and a half cent higher close. Mm. Uh, now, if we were trading at 420 and we were three and a half cents higher, meh, okay, I'd, I could get that. But we're down at the $4 level. We get 2 million tons of demand, and most of we can get out of it, all we can get out of it is 3.5 cents to the upside. That's uh, that's yeah. disappointing. Well, Chip, USDA this morning also announced the sale of 175,000 metric tons of U.S. beans for delivery to unknown destinations in the current marketing year. Soybean harvest was also two-thirds complete as of October 13, and that's well ahead of the five-year average pace. Traders generally agree that enough of the bean crop has been harvested that harvest hedge pressure will lighten from this point forward. Soybean oil reversed yesterday's price gains to pull bean prices lower, and bean meal prices saw just a limited recovery from yesterday's price pressure. November beans closed lower for a fifth consecutive session today and posted a downside reversal with a close near session lows. November beans 11 cents lower, 980. Jan beans down 9.5 cents, 994. March contract, 10.07 and three quarters on the close, down nine cents on the day, Chip. Yeah, on the day, December soybean meal up a buck 90, December bean oil down 77 points. So there's that relationship again. December cotton is attempting to build a floor of support near 70.60, and today bounced solidly from that level. December cotton today, 64 points higher, 71.26. Chip Littleberg told me that uh, we got Bubba. All right, let's get him in here. Todd Horwitz, BubbaTrading.com. How you doing, Bubba? You guys worry too much. We got oh. this inflation trade going on right now. <laughs> you you watch. You're going to have an orange juice, went over $5. This is gonna, we're going to get a nice big rally coming here. This inflation is going crazy. Interest rates are up every day. Prices are going to have to rise. I mean, the only thing that's going down is cattle. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, I, see, I was going to go to the cattle market and say, there you go, Bubba. We're starting to see some pressure on cattle with hogs going to the upside. That's, that trade is working for you. Yes, it is. But, but again, yeah. I think that we're going to see higher prices. Right now, Chip and, and Davis, the markets are so slow. There's nothing going on. I, I guess everybody's now waiting for the election. We're always waiting for something, but we can't seem to get any real price action. But if you look around the rest of the commodity space, Gold, coffee, orange juice, they're all going higher, and I think the grains are going to follow along. Okay. All right. You know, yeah, you can – there There have been times in the past where that quote-unquote inflation trade has kind of been forced into the grain markets, and and with the fundamentals in that orange juice market after Hurricane Milton, yeah, I, I can understand why we should maybe anticipate some of that, but – how much? Uh, how much of it can you expect in this in this market, Bubba? I, I think. Well, again, I think a lot's going to depend on the equities, and if the equities start to give way, which they have not, they're still up near their highs. Then it's going to be hard to find new money to come in. But I think that they're going to stress a little bit, and I do think the overall inflation trade. And remember, the orange juice that you talked about that there, that crop comes from Brazil. It doesn't even come from Florida, yeah. where he's worried about. So, but again, you got prices higher, and that's all that counts. And I, I think it's going to be a big fourth quarter for grain farmers and producers. Yep, yep. Excellent point there about the OJ. As soon as I said it, it popped into my head. And I, <laughs> so, good job. Good job. All right, Bubba, Thanks, we'll guys. talk to you next week, man. Appreciate it. Uh, you bet. Todd Orwitz, BubbaTrading.com. Coming up next, we've got Darren Hudson from Texas Tech talking cotton on AgriTalk. On your favorite radio station or your preferred digital device, AgriTalk is live every weekday. Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm Chip. Glad you're with us. Uh, we're going to talk cotton today, and along the way, I'm sure that we'll have plenty of economic uh, discussions, trade issues, policy issues. We can get into it all with Darren Hudson. Darren is the Combest Endowed Chair and the Director of the International Center for Agricultural Competitiveness at Texas Tech University. Darren, how's it going, man? It's good to talk to you again. Uh, it's going great, Chip. Glad to, glad to be here. Glad to be on. 
All right. I think we might as well get this out of the way right now. Hmm. Okay. Six and oh, yep. Texas Tech. Is that right? No, five and one. Yeah. Oh, we, five we, and one. Yeah. We, but we undefeated the, in the Big 12? Yes, undefeated in the Big 12. Yes. Right. But we, right. we still got the meat of the schedule. We got you guys coming up. So, you know, that, that's yeah. always a tough one. <laughs> Well, it, uh, yeah, I hope it's going to be a tough one. Is is what I'm hoping, but but it uh, it it is quite the race that we've got going on. It's not the race that everybody thought it was going to be at the start of the year, especially the Utah fans. But oh, <laughs> that's okay. We'll, we'll take that, it. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. Okay, Darren, let let's hop into this. The, I I just want to start with your overall impression of what is happening in the cotton market, why are we doing what we're doing? Well, I mean, I think that there's sort of two things going on. Um, one is on the production side, you know, Brazil's got a pretty good crop. Um, that's, you know, out there on the market right now. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, pressure from, you know, a pretty sizable crop that uh, Brazil has. Uh, we're a little better, you know, a couple million bales better than last year, but, you know, still not a great crop here, but, you know, yeah. it's, it, it is what it is. But on the flip side of that, they just like virtually no demand. Um, you know, the uh, mill use has just been flat and it's been flat for about five years. So really no growth in, in cotton use globally. Um, so the offtake just isn't really helping out um, with Brazil, you know, increasing its uh, its production. Yeah. Brazil's up, if I remember correctly, like two million bales year on year. Is that right? That's yep. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, but our our global carryover situation in cotton, what what is that doing to a 76 76- Point three three million bales expected at the end of the current marketing year. That would be up just a bit from seventy five point two a year ago. Right, and you know the yeah we've got uh, we've got some additional stocks. I think um, you know when you look at it globally, uh, you know we we're, we're up a couple million bales. Brazil's up a couple million bales. You know, and, and so places around the world um, are adding a bit to to the you know, the supply demand situation, but the reality is the offtake on that side is just not, you know, it's not robust. So whatever additional bales kind of get put out on the market have to go somewhere and they go into lower price and, and into stocks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, every time that we talk about cotton, Darren, it, it seems like, well, you know what? Yeah. The, the supply matters, but the 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 real factor driving prices is coming from the demand side of the balance sheet it, it, that's accurate isn't it yeah that's uh, you know we're we we've been in a you know we were in a phase in the past where uh you know production was down you know globally issues and we sort of couldn't keep up um and so you know prices were good they were solid um but you know, the last, you know, since really probably just pre-COVID um, to today, there's just been no growth, you know, now world fiber use is growing, right? So, but, but all that is being taken up by synthetics and, and we're down to around, or oh, about 23% of global fiber share is cotton. Uh, and so that demand side is really, you know, the, the weakening on that, that demand relative to polyester has just, sort of eating the sack lunch out of out of the cotton market. And, you know, there's no, you know, good sign that that is is going to recover. Um, right. You know, I think the interesting thing, like if, if you look at world fiber use and we're at 23 percent, if we go if we were to return to, say, even just 25 percent of the global fiber market, it wouldn't matter what Brazil does. I mean, that's an additional 10, 10 to 12 million bales of, of demand. And, you know, it, it would outstrip whatever we could produce at this point and prices would have to recover substantially just just to attract the acres back into production. Yeah. So what is what's behind this trend to the synthetics? Is it price? Is it quality of the synthetics? What what's driving that? 
I, I think it's a little of both. Um, you know, synthetics are very consistent and easy in a manufacturing process, very predictable. Um, they're not as high quality, obviously. It, you know, the, the the quality of the cotton, you know, apparel is is much better. But what happens is that you hit those pricing points, is what I call them, right? And so to to hit a forty dollar shirt, um, you you've got to up that polyester because it's so much cheaper in order to keep it at that pricing point in a store. Uh, and you know, so manufacturers and and retailers have basically gone to higher synthetic blends or even 100% synthetic, uh, you know, to get at that. And, you know, you know, you walk on the Iowa State campus and I guarantee you 95% of the girls on that campus are wearing Lululemon, you know, stretch pants. Yeah. And so, you know, that the the age demographic is sort of moved away from the blue jeans and, and things like that, um, you know, and if they returned, it, you know, it would significantly increase demand. But but yeah, I think it's a demand side, you know, from that price point issue is what drives, I think, a lot of retail decisions. They just they don't want to move into a 70 or 80 dollar T-shirt, you know, you know, for a Walmart mass market or, or that kind of thing. Yeah. Is there a cycle to it, Darren? I mean, can we anticipate that the that the popularity of cotton is going to come back? Well, you know, I hope so. There, there is a bit of a cyclical nature to it. You know, fashion comes and goes. Um, you, you know, I think one of the challenges that cotton has faced is the ease of care kind of issues. Um, you know, you throw that polyester shirt in the washing machine, the dryer, and you pull it out. You don't have to worry about it. I think there's been, you know, a lot of technological advances that have made cotton a little more, um, you know, sustainable in that, that realm. But, yeah. you know, I think the other side of this that, that really both the industry and and others don't seem to hit is the this whole microplastics world you know of of what's happening to my, microplastic contamination and water streams and makes yeah. it into food supplies and everything else well that comes from you know polyester shirts i mean that's one, yeah. that's one, one of the main main sources of that so i you know i think there's going to be some sort of pushback especially in that younger generation as they get more aware of what they, the environmental impact of those, those polyester clothes are, but, you know, we're just not there yet. Um, yeah. and, and hopefully, hopefully we're going to turn that corner pretty soon. Okay. All right. So, um, the cost of that shirt, that cotton shirt, I mean, and what we do, talk to me about the, the life cycle of a cotton crop here in the United States. What, how does it go from being a cotton crop to a uh, a t-shirt in my drawer? Well, so, you know, we export about 85% of our cotton. So most of that yeah. cotton that's harvested in the U.S. ends up on a ship in a bale and typically the Far East, um, you know, Bangladesh, Vietnam, China. Um, those are, manuf you know, spun, manufactured into clothing, you know, apparel items and shipped back to the U.S., and, you know, so there, there's a lot of blending that goes on, you know, U.S. cotton with other growths in those places. So there's price competition that exists across, you know, the growth space. So Brazil versus the U.S. versus Australia. But then there's also that competition in the fiber space of when we're talking about, you know, man-made synthetics and blends. Mm -hmm. So that comes back in and, and you know, the, the importers who are bringing those, those products in, you know, they're importing product. They don't much care about what content is. They just want to sell it to the Gap or whoever. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a bit of a disjoint in the industry between, you know, the the production sector and then the import sector in terms of what they're bringing in. But, you know, that that's generally how that happens. But, it, it you know, and it, and it is a window. I think the interesting thing that people forget about cotton versus corn or others is that cotton's a semi-durable good. So you don't have to buy that pair of blue jeans this year or this six months if you don't want to. Right. And so it's more sensitive. You know, the previous guest was talking about the inflation issues. Yeah. Um, the, the apparel tends to be a bit more sensitive to that. We've seen that, you know, in the in the last bout of inflation, you know, apparel consumption has really, you know, leveled off. So right. I think there's a number of those kind of economic factors that drive it from when it leaves the field to when it gets back to your drawer. Yeah, yeah, okay. That, that that was an important piece of the conversation to have here. 
I do want to talk more about the impact of the U.S. economy on that cotton demand. And then how about this? Can we put a big enough tariff on cotton products coming in from Asia to bring manufacturing back? Let's go to the markets page at profarmer.com and check today's closes. Where December HRW wheat futures were five and three quarters higher at five eighty-eight and three quarters. December SRW wheat up five and one half cents to five eighty-five. December corn futures three and one half cents higher at four oh four and three quarters. March corn was up three cents today, four twenty and one half. November soybean futures eleven cents lower, nine eighty. January beans down nine and one half cents to nine ninety-four. December cotton today was sixty-four points higher at seventy-one twenty-six. On your livestock, December fat cattle were seven and one half cents higher at one eighty-six sixty. November feeder futures ninety-seven and one half cents lower at two forty-five fifty. And December lean hogs two dollars forty-seven and a half higher at seventy-seven seventy. Get more. Visit tryprofarmer.com. Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. When news breaks, the newsmakers talk about it on AgriTalk with Chip Flory. And today we're talking with Darren Hudson, Combest Endowed Chair and the Director of the International Center for Agricultural Competitiveness at Texas Tech University. The inflation play, the the resiliency of the U.S. consumer, Darren, when we take a look at what's going on on the beef side of things, we can all day long talk about the resiliency of the of the U.S. consumer because that demand is is just it, it's borderline shocking how resilient that has been. We can can we say that about their demand for for textiles and, and clothing? You know, that's a great question because, uh, you know, the, the you, your word on the beef is absolutely right. Shocking is is the is the word you would use. Yeah. Um, I, we, you know, in cotton and apparel, it's been flat, um, which I would say is a good thing from the standpoint that yeah. it didn't crater in the face of that inflation. Um, but, you know, unit sales were down, but value was up, of course. Um, so, you know, the, the, the expenditures were pretty flat. So, and the, and the drop off in, in consumption wasn't probably as much as, as a lot of people thought it might be given, you know, past historical sensitivity. And that could just be, you know, people with more flush with cash after COVID, you know, they didn't travel, that kind of stuff and they needed some clothes. And so they bought clothes. Um, so I think that, you know, on that side of it, I think that's, so, you know, that's sort of a, a good signal that the, the consumer sort of hung in there um, on, on the apparel side. The other thing that you know, is both, I guess, good and bad is that the younger generation um, for a long time, especially through COVID, there was a lot less what we call household formation. You know, people getting married, uh, yeah. you know, starting yeah. new homes. Yeah. And so, you know, towel sheets, all that kind of stuff that have to go into it. That's picked up a bit in terms of, you know, the rate at which household formation is occurring. But this Gen Z group is a smaller group of people. Right. So at the end of the day, you know, those two might balance out and sort of keep demand flat. But, you know, I've been surprised that that we haven't seen more drop off in in apparel sales than we did. Uh, But we we certainly didn't see the growth. Okay. Well, talk. Talk to me about 70 to 75 cent cotton. I mean, wh- what does that represent to a cotton producer? Is Does it represent a, a profitable situation or not? Um, it depends on where you're at, but, you know, not not really. Um, okay. You know, once you factor in all of the, the, the programs, you know, you're probably talking at 75 cents, you're probably talking about 80 cent cotton. A yeah. lot of growers can do okay at that. Um, they they obviously like to make more money. Uh, input costs, just like you know every every other sector, 
uh, escalated, uh, you know, considerably. So that that margin has been squeezed down. So the break even price is now higher. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, I would call that the threshold. Um, and certainly if corn is higher or or wheat is higher, where, you know, the alternatives that they may look at, you know, it's not going to take a lot to draw them away from growing cotton uh, is the bottom line at 70, you know, 75 cents. Uh, but it will hold acres, uh, you know, pretty well compared to where we were this year. Okay. So the early line on acres for next year well before i ask that and and try to pin you down a little bit on that <laughs> let, let 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 me ask you this did did the last production report catch all the damage in the southeast i i don't i don't think so um okay. you know i think the um the 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 reflection of that the, you know there's still you know infield sort of assessments going on uh, and of course, WASD data, NAS data is always a month behind anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I think we're going to probably see a little bit more shaving of the of the production number. But, um, you know, some of those places weren't nearly as bad as we kind of thought they were. Uh, right. But there's a lot of, you know, there's a swath through there that just got, you know, completely drowned out, wiped out, blown away. Um, so there's a pretty significant loss. You know, and, and the interesting thing, when you look at the market, you talk about, you know, that big demand on the corn side, not not bumping corn prices. You, you know, we, we didn't see much of much action in the cotton market as a result of the, you know, the hurricanes either. Right. So, right. Uh, it, it's kind of like people are sitting on the sideline waiting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they in the last production report took 300,000 bales, 310,000 bales off of the off of the crop. And we're still looking at a carryover that's almost up a million bales from year ago. That's that's a trend that's that's tough to, to tough to build much upside momentum with. Yeah, and I mean, of course, the the update, the October update, shaved a bit off off the export side. Um, yeah. You know, puts us in the range of where we were last year. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, you you again, you're in that stock building mode, and any sort of like even hint at increases in stock seems to scare the traders a lot. Uh, and I think most of that's what's sitting out there in the Southern hemisphere waiting to be sold. Uh, it's just, yeah. it, it's just not moving very fast. So typically okay. at this point we would have been clearing through that and moving on, you know, to the U S crop. Okay. So what, what are your early thoughts on acres for 2025? I, you know, I think right now, given where corn and and wheat and and by virtue of that sorghum, um, yeah. you, you know I think we're we're going to be down, but I don't think down significantly. So, you know, I, I, I right now I would probably say you know ten point nine million acres planted, um, maybe ten five. Um, okay. You know okay. the 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 current market price is abysmal, but if you look a little bit out into the future, um, you know past this year. Uh, you know, they're recovering a little bit, um, but not a lot. I mean, if you look at December 25, you're at 73 cents. So, <clears throat> you know, that's not a huge impetus, but that, you know, that'll lock in at this point, you know, 73, 73 to 75 cent insurance price, which will make that a little more palatable than where we're sitting today. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, you teach an Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the last time we talked, you said that you teach an ag policy class as well, correct? Uh, we are in the midst of it in the fall semester. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, let me ask you this. Can we put a big enough tariff on cotton products coming from China and other Asian countries to bring manufacturing back to the U.S.? Because that's the whole theory. Of of these tariffs is that it'll bring manufacturing back. Can that happen? I I'm I'm skeptical. Um, it, it may you know you could make an argument um, a plausible argument that um, some tariffs would perhaps influence more spinning in the U.S. Um, but I think the cutting sewing operations are just so labor intensive. There's no way you you know. You, you're talking about a $25 T-shirt, you know, produced in in China. It would probably have to be a $50 T-shirt 
you know, to be produced in the U.S. to cover those costs. I think there's some segments of that 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 you know that manufacturing that is you know at the cusp and could you know with a little bit of help could probably be uh, onshored again. Uh, you know, especially spinning, uh, spinning, you know, production of towel sheets, some of those kind of basic things that don't require a lot of labor. Uh, but once you get beyond that into the apparel assembly, it, it just gets tough. And the environmental sort of regulations on dyes and chemicals and everything else certainly make that uh, a, a lot more expensive onshore. Okay. Can we move more of the cutting and sewing into Central America? You know, that's that's always been a, a question yeah. of mine. We, we've had some co- cutting and sewing in Central America. There's a little bit more that's being the capacity that's being added. Um, in in part, they're Chinese firms that are building capacity of cutting and sewing in yeah, Central America. Yeah. Um, but but I do think there's you know there's a prospect. Just the tra- transportation, logistics, and time uh, cost is is significant. And so I think you know moving cotton or yarn to Central America and product back from Central America, you know it it potentially make some really good economic sense. And I, I think yeah. we're seeing some of that investment occurring uh, and and perhaps tariffs on certain selected countries would cause them to move that manufacturing closer to the U.S. too. Okay. May not onshore right. it, but it may, but it may sh- you know, shift the thinking that maybe they need to be investing in plants in, you know, Honduras and Nicaragua. Right. Right. Okay. All right. What do you make of the, the current farm bill situation, Darren? It's an absolute unmitigated train wreck. <laughs> Not really. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the house has, I think, you know, their, their plan is there. It just needs floor time, um, you know, to get it passed. Um, Senator Stabenow has drug her feet for a long period of time. You know, there's a framework um, and I think that's been submitted to CBO for, you know, sort of scoring. Uh, but, you know, nothing's going to happen until after November 5th. And then it's only going to happen if enough pressure is put on and, you know, a stab and owl says, OK, I'm going to make this my legacy and I'm going to get this done before I you know leave office. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the contours of what is in the House bill you know, I think are are reasonably favorable given the budget constraints, you know, some increases in PLC prices, shoring up some insurance, things like that. Uh, those are all, you know, good things. But I think the, the challenge is going to be getting anything through the Senate that reallocates money out of n- nutrition programs into farm programs. Right, 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 right. All right. Darren, man, I enjoy these conversations. Thank you so much for making time for us. Go Big 12. Yes. Thanks for having me on, Chip. I enjoy it. You bet. You bet. All right. Darren Hudson from the International Center of Agricultural Competitiveness at... I don't know what you're thinking. So call us at 855-4-TALK-AG and tell us what's on your mind. Welcome back to AgriTalk, everybody. Your pal, Davis Michelson here. Chip, I was just filling out a survey a little earlier today, and uh, they asked me about my age, <laughs> my, you know, just some, some basic information. Um, yeah. And they had the little dial down for the year of your birth. Oh. And it went all the way back to... amazing how far 19, you got to scroll down now. 1915, it went back to. Okay. But why? Why would it go back that far? What? Well, I don't. I mean, I guess that's a nice ceiling. They're wishing well, yeah, us the best, obviously. Yeah, get us all the way back to uh, get us all the way to 110 years old, something like that. Something like that, yeah, right in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Wait, don't. Whew. Let me ask you. This is a yeah. delicate question. I'll ask it delicately. Do okay. you oh. still have a grandparent with us? My grandmother uh, died just a few years ago at the age of 104. She was about to turn 105. What what uh, what year was she born? You know what? I think it was 17. Okay, just yeah, wondering. That would that be, be right? Yep. Yeah. 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 I'm curious, Joe. Why do you ask? Well, I, I was going to say maybe maybe 15 isn't going back far enough for some people. Believe it or not. Listen to this guy. Wow. 
He says, give me more. Give me more. Give me more. He's an optimist exactly. is what he is. My man's yeah, going to live to right. 120. Some people <laughs> in Japan, right? Don't, don't you hear about them hanging in there? for? A, We're a long months. way from Japan over here. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yep. And, you know, to answer got... your question about do you have a grandparent yeah. in your family, um, mm -hmm. can we count ourselves? No, hey, that's, that's not that. Those grandparents? No. Oh, that's uh -huh. not the uh -huh. question no. you were asking? No. Oh. Mm. Okay. I was, well, I, was curious. I wasn't asking your grandkids. <laughs> Chip, a story we didn't get to this morning, and you mentioned it to me. Uh, put that one to the side and bring it up. Do you want, I could bring it up now. Now might be an okay time to talk about it. Do you remember? Remember what it was? Oh, yes. Bring it up. Yeah? You want to do that? Yes. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. All right. Uh, hold on. Let's make it official. <clears throat> From this morning's news, Summit Carbon Solutions urged the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Iowa to dismiss a federal legal challenge to its carbon capture pipeline, arguing the case belongs in state courts. Plaintiffs yeah. filed suits in both state and federal courts contesting the Iowa Utilities Commission approval of the pipeline. They claim compensation for eminent domain is insufficient for potential damages and criticize the easement terms allowing route modifications without yeah. further compensation, Chip. Right. Right. Uh, as we know, this pipeline has been a very controversial issue in Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, Nebraska. Uh, and, and a big part of the reason is, is because of the eminent domain uh, aspect of this, no question. But up to this point... The, it it was a, a, a state level issue in most cases, in most cases. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. RFK Jr. has made it a national issue. Oh, okay. They've got a uh, they have got a nearly thirty minute uh, short film. I, I guess is what I would call it short film out there that is basically uh, basically all, all against the the carbon pipeline the the film is called the pipeline deception and in this short film RFK jr calls it Camilla's carbon pipeline really? you want to talk about yeah. You want to talk about making it a political issue and wow. a national political issue in short fashion. Boy, it, it seems as if they have done exactly that. So yeah. uh, so here we are with with um, uh, Summit saying, <laughs> listen, you got to take it out of the federal courts and bring it back to the state issues. Well, pol politics are taking it from a state issue to a federal issue. And uh, it's it's quite the interesting process. And the thing is, Davis, I know really, really smart people, people that have had a big influence on my thinking and my career that mm. are so for the pipeline. Yeah. Okay. They want this thing done and they want it now. And I know some really, really, really smart people that have had a major influence on my career that think it's the worst thing that we could possibly do. Mm. I I don't know if I have ever uh, – and, and I mean, I'm including the cattle market issues. But mm -hmm. I, I've, I've never seen – a a uh, an issue in which people that I respect have got such differing views. I, it's unbelievable. It's oh, unbelievable. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's fair to characterize it as Kamala's pipeline, dude. We were talking about this a long time ago. Oh no, exactly. But that's what RFK calls it. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I, and that does, I, I, I'm not saying that that's fair either. No, good point. No, no. Good point. Yeah. We need, that's a good point to make. We're not yeah. saying that. 
We're no, not, we're not no, we are that. not. It is Robert we F. Reject- Kennedy Jr. that That's is right. saying that it is Kamala's pipeline. Boy, so, we about stepped and, in and, it there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're right. And and I'm not I'm not sure if I've heard anybody else call it that. So no, I haven't. No. Nope. So there you go. All right, huh. National yeah. Weather Service six to ten day outlook. October sixteenth is yes, yes. This is for October twenty second through the twenty sixth. Above normal temperatures expected over the most of the country when you get right down to it, but all the Corn Belt. Above normal precipitation, North Dakota, far northern South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, far eastern Kansas, and most of Illinois, Wisconsin. Okay? Otherwise, we're looking at near normal to below normal on the precipitation. But above normal temperatures stick around in the 8 to 14 day for October 24th through the 30th. And above normal precipitation expands across the Corn Belt in that forecast man oh man we got quite the show coming your way tomorrow morning we're going to talk to the university of mizzou afbf and asa tomorrow morning here on agritalk